We have had enough of getting everything we want. We are weary of living this life just for us. Oh, forgive us all, seeking your hand and not your face. Come and empty us, Father, we're desperate in this place. more than we deserve. You deliver us by the power of your word. God, we lift you up, giving you the honor that is yours. Thank you for your love, Father, this is what Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to Ebenezer Mennonite Church. Uh, I love to hear those conversations going on. That's great. Uh, grab your coffee and whatever you have there and find a seat. Uh, my name's Nick, one of the pastors here. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us this morning, all of you. Uh, we're glad you're here. If you're new or fairly new and we haven't met, please come and find me. Uh, I would love to just to meet you, shake your hand, and We'll set up a time we can just sit and get to know each other a little bit. I really enjoy that, so come on out during the weeks. I'm almost always in the office, and you can check with me then. 
Uh, also, I'm going to invite every week, uh, join us for the Sunday School Hour. If you're not already joining us for Sunday School, we've got some great classes from uh, our, even our senior adults all the way down to the little tiny ones. Um, we're helping to study the Word, grow together, and we need you in that. All right, important messages. Pay close attention. After the service, there will be uh, a luncheon, okay? We're going to set up tables. We're going to eat together. Uh, I think we're, they're running the, the grills right now. There is a lot of pie. I don't know how that happened, <laughs> but it's excessive. So please join us for that, all right? Uh, also, uh, the junior high are leaving this afternoon at 4 o'clock for Stowe Mission. Please be praying for them this week as they uh, serve our Lord in, at the Stowe Mission in so many ways. Uh, also, some housekeeping uh, items. Uh, and in, in just a few moments, we're going to ask Kathy Brown and some others to come to the platform. We're going to thank her for 25 years of faithful service here at Ebenezer, um, and that's upcoming. Um, but in relationship to that, uh, Kathy has been the point person for so long, particularly in the area of visitation, and where she has been the recipient of calls and calls from so many of us and so many of our families, and it's been deeply appreciated on a lot of levels. Uh, but we're going to ask that moving ahead that, that, that she's not on vacation and traveling around the West getting phone calls for that, okay? Uh, at the end of this week, she's going to be off on her retirement. So please direct your calls to the office or to uh, Pastor Dick, or Pastor Glick, or Pastor Nick, okay? <laughs> One of us will be sure to help you with that, okay? So for the time being, please... Don't call Kathy, uh, but call the rest of us, and we're going to try to pick that up and not bother her in, in that capacity. So, uh, secondly, we're posting a position to kind of help offset some of her role, okay? So, there's going to be a position offered. It's going to be an office position. Uh, we're going to have it uh, either at the office. You can pick up a job description, um, and I don't know if we have them at the welcome table or not, but just be aware of that. If you're looking for work, uh, feel, free, feel free to do that. Uh, and lastly, um, pay careful attention. In, in light of a new law in Ohio that governs the right to carry a concealed firearm, uh, the leadership of Ebenezer is requesting that for this, the safety of its members, safety team, that anyone who would like to carry a concealed firearm request permission to do so from the safety team, all right? Um, we would ask that they are aware of someone who is carrying even though some of our safety team members may be carrying, it's important that they know who you are so we're not inadvertently harming one another, all right? If you have questions of that, come and see me in the office, all right? I'm happy to talk through that with you. I'm happy to discuss the nature of that whole thing. Um, but we just want to make sure that we're looking out for the well-being and safety of everyone here at Ebenezer. Now, Bart's going to pray for us this morning. Uh, please join me in prayer this morning. Dear Lord, we just come before you this morning. We just, uh, we just praise you and thank you for being allowed to worship you this morning. We just thank you for the blessings that you've given us individually and as a church. We just praise you and thank you for everything that you've offered and given to us and that, that we can give back to you. And we want to pray for those that are uh, sick and in need of care. We want to especially remember Rhody this morning and and Dave Lugabell also, those that are having uh, health issues that, um, with, with their legs, and just, just be with them and strengthen them and just give them your guidance and comfort, Lord. And, Lord, we also want to pray for those that are grieving this morning, the families that are grieving, the, the daily family. Just remember those that are grieving and just give them your comfort, Lord. We also want to pray for our country and our nation. Lord, we know that... Uh, you put people over us, and uh, we just need to pray for them. We pray for our president. We pray for the Senate and the, and the House of Representatives, and we pray for the Supreme Court. Lord, we know that it takes a lot of wisdom and knowledge to, uh, to govern us. Lord, just give them your wisdom and your knowledge, and Lord, just be with them that so they will have godly wisdom and, and that they will, they will honor you in all their decisions and in all their work. Lord, we... Um, we pray for those that are going on the mission trip this week at Stowe. Just be with the junior high. Be with those that are 
going along to help. We just be with Pastor Dave as he's leading this. Just give him your comfort and give him your guidance and your strength. And Lord, we just pray for those that are going to be uh, that are serving and those that are getting served. Lord, just help them come to a saving knowledge of you. And Lord, just help us to remember our unity of purpose as a church, that we are here to serve you and to make disciples and help us to always be truthful in love. And Lord, just we just thank you for all the blessings you've given us and just be with us now this morning and quiet our hearts as we worship you. Just be with Pastor Nick as he leads us through the book of Romans and we just, just be with us and just help us to understand you and to serve you and to love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite the deacons and the pastors forward to come forward to you, and Kathy also to come forward so that we can honor Kathy for her years of service. Oh, also, we brought this nice uh, bouquet of flowers up. It was not done by myself or Job, I don't think. <laughs> but uh, to honor Kathy, uh, very nice, uh, Kathy. And uh, we'll let Pastor Jim and uh, Pastor Dave come up with some words for us. I have two, two things I want to say. First, on behalf of Pastor uh, Ford, um, he sends uh, his greetings to you, Kathy. And just wants to say uh, his thanks for the the vitalness of the ministry you provided for him and the church for so many years. Uh, they're on uh, vacation at the Cove, uh, Billy Graham's Cove this week, so we wanted to say a little God name right there. But personally, um, it's just a blessing to have uh, someone that you can um, work with that has high integrity, um, loves the Lord, and I would say personally a surrogate mother. Um, <laughs> you know, some of you guys know that, that my mom's not here, and Kathy is just someone that has guided me and directed me, and we will miss you. I don't think Nick wants to wear that hat. So, uh, <laughs> but we will, we will miss you, Kathy. And uh, I also want to thank you for your uh, 25 years of service, uh, wh which half was, uh, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> I had the privilege of serving you with you half, half of that time. And uh, when I think about uh, your role here at the church, I think of the, the passage from Romans chapter 12, which we as a church looked at last week with Pastor Nick, is that, you know, it begins there in the first verse that we dedicate ourselves to the Lord, and then as we dedicate ourselves to the living sacrifice, he transforms us through the renewing of our mind, and then we have this, in this renewing of our mind, a proper attitude of who we are, we don't think so highly of ourselves, or the opposite, we have nothing to offer, but when we have a proper attitude, then we look at how God has gifted us and how we serve. And you have been faithful in your service here at Ebenezer for those 25 years. Uh, you had two very important roles, which uh, makes you very unique. I don't know of any church that has a person like the roles that you did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you think of finances, you know, oh, no, man, nothing but love. Mm -hmm. And uh, also just the aspect of visitation, having uh, that on, on your plate, too. And you did them so well. And I don't think there'll be another person like that. So anyways, very gifted. Some would say you're a unicorn, and that's a good thing, and that's a good thing. So I think uh, I also think that when you uh, approach, especially the visitation aspect, I think you have a heart of compassion. Uh, I know that 2 Corinthians chapter 1 was always important to you, where it talks about praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us all in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. And that was definitely uh, the way that you performed your ministry here at Ebenezer. And also, like, uh, there's one other aspect that's unique that the staff knows, has always known about you, is uh, your love for funerals. Um, <laughs> maybe that's too strong. I don't know. Maybe you can write a book after you retire about, yeah, you probably could have had to change some names, yeah. but that's okay. Um, but... Uh, you know, it's interesting that um, Tom Rainer, uh, within the last year, uh, he, he wrote this article about 12 do's and don'ts at funerals. And one of the things that Tom Rainer, Tom Rainer is a church consultant, and he said, uh, don't read the obituary. No, no, this, no, this, 
Only good things are said here. Not <laughs> <laughs> anyways, he said, don't read the obituary because they're, they're too long, they're too boring. And, and anyways, and, and all I can say is the funerals that I have uh, to, to do here at Ebenezer, we would invite Kathy, and oftentimes she would do the obituary. But she didn't read the obituary. I don't, you probably those who have been at a funeral here notice that when Kathy did this, she made it into a life story. And you were so good at that. Mm. You were so good. So any, anyways, um, don't read the obituary if it's into a life story, which you did. You were, you were ahead of Tom Rayner in, the, in, what, in what he said. So that's some of the good. So anyways, with that, Friday, July 1st is your last official day here at Ebenezer. And so may the Lord bless you and Dave as you start this new adventure <laughs> together uh, in, in life. As part of this, the, the church would like to give Kathy a gift for her years of service, and we just would like to honor her with this. Before you go, uh, before you go, um, it's a it's a gift to Amish country, and, and their last attempt at Amish country was um, you ask her this story. It, it was um, weather related, I believe. So anyway, quite a great story. But let me pray um, as we congratulate you on your upcoming retirement. Again, you are like a unicorn, no question about that. Uh, your gifts, we're not just limited to that. If you didn't see her at VBS and other places, you've missed out. Uh, we appreciate you dip deeply. We wish you safe travels, as I'm envious as you're going to travel through the West, and, uh, and just pray the Lord's blessing. So let's pray. Father, we, we give you thanks today for Kathy, for her service, for uh, her finding uh, just the niche that uh, worked with her so well, and as she uh, just joyfully served everyone here at Ebenezer. I just thank you for that. I thank you for her enthusiasm and heart for the work, and I just uh, pray that you would bless her and Dave as they go out and, and do some traveling and enjoy uh, retirement years. I pray you'd bless them and pray you'd bless their family and that you would grant them uh, just a pleasurable time, that you would uh, grant them health and strength for many years to come. And we thank you and praise you uh, for that goodness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Kat. <laughs> what a joy when you have a church family that feels like family. Um, so take a minute, stand up, say hi to each other, and in a minute we'll start worship. Good morning, sweet friends.
seated. Today is Compassion Sunday, so join us in watching this video and then having a presentation. My name is Nora Birongi. I'm from Uganda. 
We are Jeff and Bonnie Mowry. Nora was 10, I was 20 years old, and we sponsored her all the way completely through her program. They used to write to me letters, like almost every month. They always told me that they loved me, I was so special, and that's gonna make it. Three things never miss their letters. Uh, we, we did something so little. We felt like it was just so little. Jeff and I started realizing is we're looking at the small portion that we did and not looking at the magnification that God did. And that is through all of the Compassion team. At the Compassion Project, I always looked forward to going there because there was always good food. We could have chicken, eggs, milk, rice. So the monthly sponsorship empowers the Compassion team to provide the food, the medical care, the education care, but also the spiritual care with the programs that bring these kids in and teach them about Jesus. The praise and worship there was just the best time for me. We used to dance and, you know, and all the time I could go back home and still do the same things with my mom and my other siblings. To think that you're just changing a child's life is too small of an understanding of what's going on. It's not just changing a child, it's changing the family, it's changing the community, it's changing the culture. The degree to which God multiplies everything that's given through all the people in compassion is phenomenal. When we were told we had the chance to meet Nora, I, I was almost speechless and it was just like, how could we not? Of course we want to meet her. I would like to say thank you, thank you so much to my sponsor, Jeff and Bonnie Mori. I hope I see you one day. I love you so much, wherever you are. How about today? No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for what you did for me. Thank you for loving me. As a sponsor, that $38 is expounded and it's incredibly multiplied. And it's stunning to see that what we see as so little Nora sees the end result of it. To realize that you have even your small role to play because that small role doesn't stop with you. It continues on and it, it lights a candle that lights another candle that lights another candle and it becomes exponential and that's in the hands of our God. Uh, my name is Allison, and I'm a, um, a volunteer with Compassion, and I love that video. <laughs> but um, it, I've been fortunate enough to meet several children that my family sponsors, and it's, it's amazing. These are, you know, real kids, and I even have friends who are graduates of the Compassion program. We've had a couple graduates come here and speak that you guys have been able to meet. And I do have friends that I keep in touch with who've been through the program, and it's amazing how impactful it was and how it really changed their life. Um, so Compassion partners with local churches around the world um, to help provide care and love to children. And ultimately, like the video showed, it, it reaches out to families and communities, and um, it's a lot bigger than just the one child that you're sponsoring. And sponsorship... I'm gonna have a table set up over here, so please come and talk to me after. But to sponsor a child is $38 a month. Um, and it's incredible, incredible to see how that money can be expanded into so much, it just is multiplied. Compassion links one child to one sponsor. So you would be that child's only sponsor. And the precious faces on these packets, so these are kids who've been waiting to find out that they're going to have a sponsor. I have a lot here that have been waiting for almost a year or even over a year. This little boy, Junior, has been waiting over 400 days to find out he has a sponsor. Um, yeah, I just ask that you guys will come talk to me after and ask questions. 
look at these spaces and thank you. Thank you, Allison. I like that video. <laughs> Romans chapter 13. It's kind of hard to follow a video like that. But the immediate thing that jumps to mind is this. If we go into Romans chapter 13, um, people who have uh, felt God's call to uh, adopt a compassion child have, a, and as they would say, a very small gift comparatively. Um, and that little bits of obedience to God and that uh, can have long-ranging impact. Small acts of obedience can have long-ranging impact. What I'm going to ask you this morning in Romans chapter 13 is not a small act of obedience. If a small act can have large impact, I'm going to ask for a big act today. I'm going to ask you for a large act of obedience that Paul asks of the Romans. So hold on to your hats. We're going to have some fun. Romans chapter 13. I'm going to start with this. Uh, Romans chapter 13 um, really wrestles with the idea is, is, is who's the boss, right? Uh, I, I find it interesting. I don't know if you've ever uh, uh, watched children or had children or experienced people who, um, who were told to do something or asked to do something, and I don't know if you've ever heard these words, you're, you're not the boss of me. Right? Anybody ever said that? I'm like, You're not the boss of me. You don't get to tell me what to do. Right? It's in, it, yeah. I see. Thank you. I see that hand. <laughs> I appreciate the honesty. All of us in some capacity don't like to be bossed around, honestly, right? We're, we are disinclined uh, to acquiesce when people say, you need to do something. We tend to resist. I found this little brief article from Cleveland Clinic. And since it's from Cleveland, it must be right, right? I don't know about that. It says, one of the first thing a child learns to say and understand is the word no, right? Uh, one, you have to tell them that a lot, right? Because they're getting into stuff that they would not be safe if they got into it. But when, you, when they're doing something and you don't want them to do it and, and you start to interrupt that, they're going to tell you no. Right? They're going to tell you that as if they don't want you to be uh, the boss. He said, toddlers are told not to throw the ball in the house, and they do it again anyway. Teenagers roll their eyes when they're asked to wear a seatbelt, and when nobody's looking, they unbuckle. Right? Adults get angry and defensive when they are told by their doctor to eat your vegetables and to exercise. So they just get stubborn, and they don't. Right? Do your therapy. You'll be better for it, right, Jeremy? But guess what? They don't want to do it. We as humans, say, it says, crave independence and autonomy. We want to be the ones calling the shots, making the rules. We don't want somebody else telling us what to do. And it says, and although the idea of rebelling against authority or rules is not new, and they bring the idea that, uh, the Corona's pandemic has brought out some uniqueness to our resistance, doesn't it? I mean, I'm like, uh, how did you feel when they said you can't go visit somebody? Or you must wear a mask, or you have to do this, or you have to do that. Did anybody feel just a little bit of the hair, come, the hackles coming up, telling me, you're going to tell me what to do? I don't think so. And, and, and that's been an issue, hasn't it? I mean, I think it's uh, been difficult for a lot of people, but he, he says even most so, more, more so, our inner rebel just can't be, stand being told what to do. And he says, no one really likes being told what to do. Resistance is ingrained in our culture and our brains from a young age. Everyone has some form of inner rebel that likes to question or do the opposite of what we're told. Experts call this feeling or need to rebel psychological reactance. 
Okay. God just calls it rebellion and sin. It's your brain's reaction when you don't get your own way. That's just the nature of it. We like our comforts. We like it our way. We like the world to be like we want the world. So I'm asking my, the, myself the question. I'm going through that. Uh, who's the boss of you? Who is the boss of you? Is God the boss of you? Are you okay with saying, okay, I'll let God be the, the boss? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Oh, hopefully we're all going to say, yes, God, you get to be the boss because you're big and we're small. And there's very little we can do about that fact. Are you okay? And I'm just going to assume that for today, you're going to say that God's okay being the boss, right? You can nod your head. Good. Oh, no, that wasn't much head nodding here. Okay, God's the boss. Now I'm going to ask you the secondary question. Are you okay with God appointing somebody else to be the boss over you? What if God delegates some of his authority to someone else? In which he says, I want you to subject yourself to their authority because I gave it to them. Are you okay with that? <laughs> he smiles out there. Suddenly we're not as okay with that idea, are we? That's what we're going to get to today. Romans chapter 12, because we have to start there just because this is all one package, okay? Just because there's a chapter break, it isn't indicative that there is actually a break in thought, okay? This is tied all the way back to chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, when he says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Okay, what he's saying here is you want to know how to worship. That's that, that's that term that, he, that I used last week. This is what worship looks like. You want to know what worship is? He doesn't say it's about standing up and singing, though we love to sing. We love to do worship service. He's saying your act of worship is being transformed as a person by the renewing of your mind that you can prove the will of God. And he's going to say these are the things Test it out. See if you can walk the will of God. And he jumps right into it. Don't think more of yourself than you should. That's starting with you. Understand yourself clearly. This is how you worship God, by having a clear understanding of yourself. Not to think yourself too highly or think too lowly. Serve in the gifts that he's given you. Do it as you've been gifted. And then he talks about, hey, how to interact with other people. Love them without hypocrisy. Avoid evil stuff. Cling to good stuff. Uh, be passionate about it. And then he goes through chapter 12 and he talks about handling people who are persecuting you or mistreating you. or That's a part of worship. And after he gets to all those things, those are very personal. Those are pretty much one-on-one -on -one stuff. How do, how do I handle it if Karis is unkind to me? What he would never be. He's, he's, very, he's helpful to me in my class. But if so, how do you do it on an individual level? We can kind of wrestle through some of that, right? Treat people kind of like they treat you. Try to love them kind of the same. And then he, then he ups the ante a little bit here in chapter 13. In chapter 13, this is another form of worship as connected to chapter 12. Chapter 13 of Romans takes this idea that God is going to delegate some of his authority to other people of which whom we're supposed to subject ourselves to. That's a new idea here. It's one thing to think that we're kind of autonomous and we all have to just kind of get along together. And now he brings a new idea. What if worshiping him is actually acknowledging and subjecting ourselves to authority that God has set up for us? Can we do that? Are we willing to worship God in light of that? Allow me to read Romans chapter 13. I'm going to read it clear through. There's just 14 short verses, and then we'll unpack it a little bit. It says, Let every person be subject to, to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a rule, not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. 
But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore fulfilling is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time. You know that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies, drunkenness, sexual morality, sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Interesting, when he gets to this thing, he's just making some really direct statements. Verse 1, let's look at that real quickly. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Let every person. He's not saying, okay, just let, you know, people who are, you know, depends on which side of the aisle they're standing on, we'll subject ourselves to the governing authorities that stand on my side of the aisle. He's not given that kind of flexibility. He's saying, let every person be subject to, has the idea of being under the authority of. Be subject to that. It's not rocket science, folks. It's just an exercise of our intent and will to worship. You realize that, right? This is connected to our worship. You want to test whether you are in the will of God and that you are willing to worship God, then it's going to be dependent on whether you are willing to follow very direct instructions. Let every person be subject, be placed under to the governing authorities. Four, circle that four. This is a causative statement here. There's a purpose. Why would you do that? Four, the answer is there is no authority except from God. Authorities around the world, all over the world, are God's. It doesn't exist unless God made it exist. And it says, and those that exist have been instituted by him. That means he set them up. Can God set up authorities that are a pain in the neck? Well, yeah. That's pretty much how all authorities go eventually, right? They're, they're difficult because they're expecting something that we don't want to give. We want to do it our way. And he's like, they're all there because God set them up. If you've got your finger in your Bible there, I'm going to just roll over to John 19. It's a really interesting statement here in John that the Lord Jesus is like, I mean, he's been dragged around the courts. He's getting ready to be put to death at the cross, right? And he is standing before the authority of the day. John 19, verse 10, talking to Pilate. Pontius Pilate um, says, Pilate therefore said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you? I have authority to crucify you. He's the big boss. Don't you realize I'm the big boss, he's saying. I can turn you loose. I can have you killed. And Jesus makes this statement, and I find it interesting. I don't think it was said with uh, a neener, neener attitude, right? I think he just said, Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. 
For this reason, he who delivered me up to you has a greater sin. He's just saying, the authority that you have has been granted by my father. Yes, you have authority. But you wouldn't have it had he not granted it to you. So Jesus himself was acknowledging the authority. He acknowledges that God set it up. Proverbs 21, 1 is just another one. That even back in those days, it was saying something down that very line. Can God do that? Proverbs 21, 1. The king's heart is like a channel of water in the hand of the Lord. God is not separate from authority. God can do with it as he chooses. He has for, for millennia. Now, as we get into this and we start coming face to face with this idea of subjecting ourselves to governing authorities, uh, we're, we're plagued with some issues. Um, what happens if I don't? That's usually what happens to the kids, you know. They're going to say, don't, don't go across this line, right? And what's the test? See what happens, right? Lightning didn't fall. Thunder didn't roll. Don't do it again, right? That's how we live. That's how kids live, right? And so he's, he's actually addressing that very thing. Therefore, whoever resists, knowing that when we say subject yourself, our first thought is resistance, right? I want you to do something, and their first thought is no. What are you going to do about it? Can you stop me? Isn't that how we roll a little bit? He says, therefore, whoever resists authorities resists what God has appointed. The offense is not directly against the authority. Its resistance is against God. And this is really hard to get our head around. If God establishes an authority and we resist that authority, are we not resisting God's design? Well, what if they're really bad? Or what if they're stupid? Or what if they spend my tax money badly? I certainly wouldn't have to follow it then, would I? God certainly dropped the ball on this authority, right? No. It says that those who resist authorities resist what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. That means God is not letting you off the hook. And I'm like, well, my resistance is you know, it's kind of passive-aggressive. You guys get that, right? You, I, mean, I mean, you guys wouldn't get that. But I'll, let me tell you what passive-aggressive looks like, right? I, I can resist inside. You ever been driving down the highway, and you're really getting somewhere in a hurry, and you, you see people slowing down, right? And you know that there's a trooper sitting right out in that thing down towards Lima. <sighs> So you slow down, but inside you're still racing madly, right? You might get me to slow down on the outside, but I'm speeding on the inside, right? Isn't that kind of how kids work, right? You can maybe compel them to do what you want them to do, but how is the heart behind that? Those who resist will incur judgment. And I thought, you know what? We might be thinking of revolution. We might be thinking of insurrection we might be thinking of shaking a fist directly in the face and i will not what if it's not like that what if it's more like this genesis exodus exodus chapter 16 see if you remember this exodus 16 they're out in the desert and they set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month of their departure from the land. And the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. They complained, not against God, but against the authorities that God has established. And they said, the sons of Israel said to them, 
Would we that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat, we ate bread to the full, and you brought us out into this wilderness to kill us, this whole assembly of hunger. And who responds? Moses and Aaron? No. Then the Lord said to Moses, you see, God heard their grumbling. God heard their complaints as they grumbled against his authorities. And God responds to them, and they have major problems. A little while later, chapter 17, then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin according to the command of the Lord and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink, and therefore the people quarreled with Moses. Hmm. They quarreled with him and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord, Jehovah God? I would contend, folks, that when he says, Therefore, whoever resists authorities will resist what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. I think our biggest resistance are on this whining, complaining, griping attitudes that we share all the time in the name of whatever political, whatever position we're in. I believe it goes directly to the ears of God. But, well, well some of these leaders are just bad people. To the ears of God. Now, as I was going through this, I find that he's going to get into some other stuff here. But here's what I find. I find that the most commentaries, I started looking up this. What do other people say about this? Because this like, is really a sharp stick in the eye. You know? And so it's like, what do the other commentators say about this? Well, I found that most commentators are looking for about a thousand ways to get around it. You, you have to obey the authorities if and if, and, but not in... And then I'm like, wait a second here. What if God intended us just to say, your worship means to subject yourself to those authorities as unto me? If we can't subject ourselves to the authorities that God has established, are we really subjecting ourselves to the divine, if you will, org chart? God's at the top, no question. Are we just rejecting him outright by our complaining? He goes on to say this, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. So this is given our first little window of how do we live in this tension of people who are authority who are telling us how to behave ourselves. Good conduct. Good conduct makes a big difference in a world even when you've got incompetent or wicked rulers. It works. For you would have no fear of the one who is in authority, then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. You know, this works. I'll give you a really practical example. I was living, working in Milwaukee, all right, and we had a prisoner reentry program, and we had determined we were a in our own office, we, we had a vast array of political viewpoints, okay? I mean, vast. We had, we had libertarian on one side. We had socialist on another side. We're all on the same team for prisoner reentry. And we determined that we are going to present an apolitical service. We're going to serve people, love people, help people. And that's the beginning and the end of what we do. In the name of Jesus, we're just going to do that. And we showed up every day, and we did that. And we did that, and we did that. And the phone calls started coming in from Madison. That's like the capital. From the director of corrections. How are you doing this? People aren't going back to prison. How are you doing this? We love and help people. That's all we're going to talk about. The next thing you know, I'm getting calls from the U.S. attorney, from the, the district up there. How are you doing this? Great job. How can we help you do this better? I'm getting called from the prisons. How are you doing this? 
The, the district attorney, people keep coming to us and they say, come to this meeting. we got a whole bunch of people. We want you to tell us what you're doing. Um, we're loving people and we're trying to help people do good with their lives and not go back to prison. And we're, we don't apologize that we're Christians. That's just us. And they're like, well, anything you need from us, you let us know. And I'm like, what? I did not expect that response. Then they start to needle in a little bit. They want to know what political party you're off of, right? Because so they can, they can put you in a camp, right? I remember one guy spent two hours working me, working me, trying to figure out. And he, and he got to the end. He shook my hand. He said, Nick, I really appreciate you. You're the most politically agnostic person I know. And I said, thank you very much, because you know what? Tomorrow morning, there's a whole bunch of men and women getting out of prison that nobody cares about. And the need to do good remains. And it doesn't stop, because I have a political preference. The answer isn't who's in authority. The answer is, what are you doing with your life? You do good stuff. Everybody appreciates it. They want good stuff in society. Everybody does. Everybody wants peace. Everybody wants less crime. Everybody wants those people to succeed. Are you doing part of that? Or are we fussing and fighting about politics and not doing the job that needs done? He's just saying good conduct works, but bad conduct, well, you're going to get it in the shins. For he, meaning the servant, God's servant, is... Here's servant for good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. God is the establisher of this. God is the establisher. This is pointing all the way back to Genesis chapter 9. I don't know where you stand, and I'm not even going to ask where you stand on capital punishment. But in Genesis chapter 9, that's what God did. God established men to govern other people, falling right out of the flood. God was the judge of people. He poured his wrath out and drowned them all, except a handful. And after they came off the boat, he answered the question. He made a very simple statement to Noah. He said, Noah, listen up. He says this, whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For he is in the image of God, he made man. Now, it helps to understand just a little bit of Hebrew. He says, whoever singular sheds man's blood, individual, by man, plural, the whole, his blood will be accounted for. God has said, I'm going to give it over to somebody else. I just took the lives of all these wicked people. Now, people are going to take care of that in the future. And he established government. They don't bear the sword in vain. God has given them the sword. God has governed by government as his subsidiaries, if you will, for a long, long time. And when they do that, God is the one. I found that I went to the jungles of Indonesia. Largely wild territory. I mean, in the jungles. I mean, jungle people with loincloths and bows and arrows and spears. And little tribes had laws. That you couldn't get away from. If you did something wrong, they're going to kill you. You steal somebody's coconut, they're going to kill you. They had rules. God has impacted it in the lives, in the hearts of people. That's how it functions. Now, can God do it with really horrible people? Oh, my goodness, yes. Again, put your finger there. We're going to roll back to Isaiah. Isaiah is pretty easy to find. If you can find Psalms, turn right just a little bit, and you're going to be in Isaiah. But in Isaiah chapter 5, great passage here. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 26, makes this statement. Is that correct? He's talking about punishing Israel because of they've been so wicked and he says, and he will lift up a standard to a distant nation, speaking of God, and he will whistle for it from the ends of the earth. 
And in behold, it will come swiftly, and no one in it is weary or stumble, no one slumbers or sleep, nor is a belt at a waist undone, and not a sandal strap is broken. The arrows are sharp, and they're all bent. The hooves of his horses seem like flint, and the chariot wheels like a whirlwind. And he's talking about God, all God has to do is whistle for him. You know, you have a dog that runs around the yard, and you want to call him in for, for a snack, you whistle for him. And the dog comes running. That's what he's saying. I'm just going to whistle for a nation that's going to come in here. And he's talking about Assyria, and he picks it up again in chapter 10 of Isaiah. In chapter 10 of Isaiah, he says, woe to Assyria because he called them out. They whipped the daylights out of the northern tribes. They were vicious. They were, they were cruel. God had called them to do that. And then God says, okay, now I'm going to punish him for that. Don't tell me for a second that God can't bring really wicked people into authority to do a plan that he has. He's done it, and he's done it again and again. The scripture is replete with that stuff. God's wrath will be exercised via the hands of men. Verse 5, therefore, coming back to it, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid the wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. The Spirit of God, if you allow the Spirit of God to live in you, and He lives, I mean, He lives in you if you're a believer, if you will listen, the Spirit of God will convict you toward this end if you are open to that. Your conscience via the Spirit will say, quit complaining and go do something good with yourself. Your conscience will help you to that end if you're open to it. I love our country. I love our country, the freedoms that we have. And if you haven't traveled internationally, we have wonderful freedoms in America. But we are a country of rebels. We, we are rebels from the get-go, from when the time we were dumping tea in the harbor. Right? We, we, we don't want people telling us what to do. We, we make it a hallmark to be this fiercely independent people. And I fear that it's, it's ingrained itself into our hearts to a point where we have resisted God. Well, God's saying, this type of resistance isn't from me. This type of resistance is from somewhere else in you. And it's not true to worship. It is not true to the worship of me. And he's going to go on and give us a little further of this. You do it because of conscience. Verse 6, you also, because of this, you pay taxes. Ooh. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to the very thing. They charge taxes and it feeds them so they can keep doing what they do. God's just set it up that way. I don't know about you guys, but I don't like to pay taxes. I pay as few of them as possible within the, the law, right? I don't like sometimes how our government spends money. Big deal. Doesn't change the fact that this is what you do. Because of this, because of conscience sake, because of doing what's right, I pay taxes because they're God's people. They're God's ministers. And that term minister there is a serious one. It has the idea of almost like a priest, priestly role where they serve him in a way as, as if he did it with he did the priest. He put them in a place and you take care of them in that sense. I know some guys who said, that's enough of this tax stuff. I don't like that. I had a good friend of mine. And he's like, I ain't doing this anymore. I don't like this government. I don't like how they're spending my money. And so I'm just going to declare myself a sovereign citizen. I'm like, what? I don't even know what you're talking about. You know? So he gave me a 14-hour description of it. And elected to stop paying taxes. You know, our government has a pretty strong reach. Uh, you know, so if, if they want what you have uh, and you didn't give it to him, they can come and get it. Much to his surprise, his bank accounts like went missing. Poof. I'm like, I'm like they, they took my money. Um, yeah. He raged and complained. You know what? God has established them. And even though we may not like it, remember what Jesus said? And they said, do you, do you give honor to Caesar or not? Do you pay taxes? They're trying to trick him. And he takes the coin, and what does he say? Whose image is on the coin? 
Oh, it's Caesar. Well, then give to Caesar what's Caesar's, which is that. And then he makes a really critical statement, and I think we miss it sometimes. And then he says, and give what to God is God's, which is what bears God's image. Oh, yeah, we do. We are made in his image. We give Caesar the coinage, fine. But do you give God you? Have you subjected yourself, surrendered yourself to God to the point where you say, God, if you put somebody over me, I'm just going to accept it from you. And I'll honor you the same. I'll worship you. I'm just going to keep doing good. Governments go like this. Laws go like this. What do you do? Are you, are you, like, a, <laughs> are you like a thermometer? Do you just go up and down as the, the, the political temp- temperatures go? Or are you like a thermostat? You just, nothing changes you. You're just going to show up the next morning and do the right thing. Do good works. Love your neighbor. Do the things that you were intended to do. Which are you? Pay him what you need. You pay him taxes. Pay him revenue. Pay him respect. Pay honor. Pay them. Pay them all. Don't let any of those things be outstanding. Verse 8. Oh, no one, anyone, anything. That means in light of what he just got done saying. Don't let those things be hanging out there. Those are a detriment to the sake of the ministry, to the sake of life. The only thing that it should be owed is this perpetual debt to love each other. That's what you owe every day. Don't owe them any of that stuff. Get that stuff out of the way. But love each other. And then if, if you understand how language works, there's, there's, there's value in finding things that are repetitious. As we study how to study the scripture well in, in our class, the Sunday school class this morning, one of the things that the language uses is repetition. And if you'll notice, in the next verses, the term love shows up like six times. Oh, no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves has fulfilled the law. For the commandment says you shall cannot commit adultery, murder, steal, covet, commandments of it. You shall love the neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong. Therefore, love is fulfilling. I've heard a lot of political wrangling in the last few years. And very, very little of it had love at the heart. It just didn't. It didn't, and I'm starting to wonder, have we got off the exit politically, folks? And have we let politics hijack our faith to the point where we can't love people anymore? We have refused to love each other. We have refused to the point where we don't even want stuff to do with other people. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Divine worship is shown up by how we love. And he closes out with one thing here, and I think it's interesting. Verse 11, he says, besides all of this, besides all of this, you know the time. Yeah, it's about 1121. That means my time is about up. Besides all this, you know what time it is. And we're like, we do. The hour has come from you to wake from sleep. Salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The idea there is not salvation to get saved and come into a right relationship. The idea here is the fact that your deliverance, you're going to be snatched out of here one of these days quick. That is close. That is close. Don't you know that it's time to wake up? I don't know if you guys ever, when it was time for vacation. When I was a kid, I mean, it's like you can't sleep the night before, right? And it's like 3.30 in the morning. I'm out of bed and I'm dressed. I'm sitting on the bed waiting for mom and dad to get up so we can go. Right, I'm going fishing. Do you know what time it is, believer? Do you live as if you know what time it is? He says it's time to wake up because Jesus is coming back. The night is far gone and the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness. He he takes the metaphor of 
of get these filthy clothes of this old life away from us. This, this, this wrangling and bitterness and complaining and grumbling that we, that we put out all the time with, with those who are in. Get rid of that stuff. Years ago, I was back on the pig farm. I'll tell this story very briefly. And we happened to have a large confinement operation. And on this given day, one of my big old sows found her way down into a liquid manure pit. She had to get out, right? Somebody had to go down there and get her out. Yeah. So down I went, wrapped a big old rope, that was gross, around her, and we got her out of there, right? Can't tell you how quickly I wanted to get those old clothes off. It takes about five, six showers before the stink that goes with it gets off. He's saying, let's get rid of that old stuff. Let's get rid of that stinky old behavior that says we are going to wrangle and fight come whatever. Particularly when it surrounds the idea of authorities. Get rid of that stuff. That stinks. It goes around and everybody around it stinks too. Oh, you can find some other people that stink the same way you do and you don't notice after a while. But guess what, folks? Get rid of that stuff. Wouldn't you rather be sweet-smelling to everyone? Wouldn't you rather have people from every political party rejoicing that you are doing good works for somebody? They're glad you're here in their community? They're, They're happy to have you? Get rid of that stuff and put on, dress in, he's, he's keeping that metaphor, the armor of light, which is really a, a kind of a, a shift. Because normally it's the other side that's fighting, right? He's saying put on the armor of light because it's a fight to do the right thing. To keep your heart right before God. To not be complaining all the time. To not be fighting against the authorities that God has placed there. Put on the armor of light. Get rid of that sticky stuff. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Not in orgies or drunkenness and sexual morality or sensuality. Not quarreling and jealousy. Let's walk properly. Let's not do those old things. Big contrastive but. But put on. Dress in the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on Jesus Christ. I find that people wear the number or jersey of their favorite sports person, right? They want to emulate that person. They're out playing basketball in their sports jersey, right? With their, their, and they're counting it down. You know how it is. We, we want to be like them. He's saying, put on, dress in, act like the Lord Jesus Christ. And how did he handle politics? How did he handle authorities? He just did good stuff. He didn't let that get in his way. He served and loved people all the time to the point where they put him on a cross. And he could have, by his own authority, usurped it and he trusted God with that and then it makes this last term you need to catch this make no provisions for the flesh that term provision is this planning and preparation that's kind of how we do it we plan to take care of our own flesh don't we in fact we go to great details about taking care of our own flesh anybody here like shopping for clothes Oh, ladies are smiling there for a second. A bunch of guys are like, we make preparations so we can do stuff that we really want to take care of ourselves. He's saying, don't make any preparations. Don't don't set up. Don't work about providing that. Make plans and preparations for doing good. That's what I'm going to leave you with. These are the ideas. Number one, check your authorities. Who are your bosses? If you're at a job, you want to know who your boss is, right? And you want to take care of your boss. You can do what they ask. That's just the thing. Check your bosses. Identify that who God has placed in authority and say, God, I want to worship you by how I respond to the authorities you've placed over me. I want to worship you. Secondary, do good. Find some place to intentionally be doing good so everybody's going to know what's up with this person. They just keep helping and serving and doing good things. I love them. I wish I had a a thousand of them in my community to do that sort of thing. 
So nobody, they wouldn't have any complaints against you. And then lastly, be actively ready and preparing for a new government because Jesus is coming back. Get yourself ready. Anticipate his coming. I have a sense that he's going to come back and we're all going to be fighting about stuff that he's like, what's the deal here, guy? Didn't I tell you I'm coming back? And you guys like not even ready. You're not even expecting me. Set your life up. Provide. Plan. As if that's happening today. If not today, tomorrow. And I think we are going to worship him in a new way. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this passage. It kind of, uh, it's hard for me at times to accept the fact that you've placed people in authority over me in our government that I would not always agree with. Help me to worship you. Help us to worship you in a way that's pleasing, in a way that accepts authority as from your hand. Help us to keep our eyes and hearts fixed on you, prepared for your coming, serving, loving our neighbors, doing good at every turn, uh, that we would be uh, pleasing to you in all that we do. We petition your closeness. Be with us, Lord. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join me. What a great phrase he uses there at the end, that we need you. Um, how thankful we can be that he doesn't ask us to do this in our own strength and, and on our own, but that we can lean on him, that as we need him, he'll fill us with his spirit and empower us to do just what Nick talked about.
righteousness, oh God, how I need you. It's true we need him, whether it's as simple as getting one of those compassion kids and changing a life or living the rest of our lives day to day in a way that's honoring. We need him for that. So let's pray, and then we're going to set up for our thing. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your encouragement in your word. and pray that by your spirit you would lead us and guide us and that we would be willing to be led. We thank you. We praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you go, just real quick, we're going to set up tables. So 